so hi Sam welcome to the Truffle Forager podcast hi thank you for having me um I'm really excited to, to have a chat with you um a bit nervous <laughs> I've not done one of these before um, it's all good yeah, it's thanks. completely normal to be nervous I, I'm, <laughs> I'm nervous I've, I still get really nervous I mean I've only done a handful of these but I, I get nervous um you know I had butterflies in my stomach this morning already just thinking about it so if that's oh. you as well all good all good um so yeah it's it's uh really really great to have you on and um you know it's good to reconnect with you as well like properly and see yes. your face again I know yeah. we touch base um back yeah. in the middle of the pandemic as well you know back when but at least for me my I was a bit of a wandering soul trying to you know yeah it was it was become a forager time. and yeah <laughs> although I did but, um, I did quite enjoy the pandemic because there was nobody in my woods <laughs> <laughs> more more uh, more mushrooms to forage more more yeah. things to find oh it's just more quiet and less litter and less poo and it was just nice <laughs> Everybody was home. very nice very nice <laughs> well um as i said it's a pleasure to have you and really looking forward to picking your brain um mm -hmm. and i know you're, you're really up to speed with your you know your mushrooms and uh poisonous mushrooms as well you said you were really interested in which is you know i'm sure we can jump yeah. into that a bit later um but just to just to sort of bring the audience and the listeners up to to speed a little bit um could you just share a minuscule bit about like you know how you got into uh wild food foraging and and also what you're up to now okay so um I've always kind of gone for, for walks with my mom and my nan as a child and we pick blackberries and damsons and we'd make jam. So it was a sort of typical, you know, forager story. Um and then when uh when I moved in with my husband at the back of where we lived, there was a, a canal and that's got so much fruit. So I was like a a scrumper. Um and my husband bought me a foraging course for my birthday and that was it. Something inside me just went, Yeah, you ain't never going back. <laughs> um so we, I think within an hour of doing that foraging course I'd booked on to like two others and it just became an absolute obsession um I've always been like interested in mushrooms my first ever mushroom book I actually bought when I was 16 for my GTSE art project um just so I could copy the pictures uh, I didn't realize I was buying a bible um and and just like the more the more I forage the more I find out the more I get excited um and actually now my journey is kind of taking me down down more of the geeky side of things okay um, yeah I've been getting a microscope out and looking oh, at have you? scrolls and I, I mean I've no nice. idea really what I'm doing I'm right at the beginning of the journey of that but I'm getting into the non-edible stuff now I'm just going wow it's just it's just cool <laughs> very nice very nice I've, yeah. I've been dallying with um you know the thought of getting a microscope and taking it to that next level um yeah. i've even been looking at videos online of people doing and because of technology now things like dna sequencing potentially can yeah. be done at home like with these kits that are you know i don't know hundreds of pounds rather than thousands of pounds yeah. but you know not not really dipped my toe into there yet so it's, it's really cool to speak to someone who has dip their toe into yeah, the microscopic it's, it's, side of things at least it's been it started sort of september october so this this last six months i've just total totally turned into a nature nerd um <laughs> which has been lovely because i've i've um i've left my job that i had before and now setting up on my own and i've just i've had a lot more time to research and go for walks and find stuff um it has actually been like a mind-blowing journey. Um, I've got really into moss and bryophytes as well, um, and I have moss and what? Sorry, bri bryophytes. Bryophytes is the technical do, name. Do explain. Do explain. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the yeah. technical name. Right. That's the technical, the scientific name. Um, and in the last six months, I've discovered two ridiculously rare species because I've been out and I've been looking. Um, so I found uh, a blackening of, chanterelle. Of moss. Of mushrooms. Oh, of mushrooms. Okay. So. Uh, one was one was a blackening chanterelle, which I thought was a just a winter chanterelle, um, and I was corrected on that by uh, by a good friend uh, Jesper Lander. Uh Thanks, Jasper. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other one. This is where the moss thing comes in. Um, I found little teeny tiny, like maybe like a millimeter across um, mycorrhizal bryophyte mushroom, Luteodiscus bryophyllus um which 
uh, I had no clue what it was. I had a look in Temperate Europe. The, the fungi of Temperate Europe wasn't, and I was like, oh my god. Um, so sorry, so Sam. I, before you move on, the, for the people who don't know some of the long words you've just mentioned, the the mycorrhizal briar fryer mushroom. <laughs> mycorrhizal. Explain to us what's going on so here. That's that's a fungi that has a mycorrhizal relationship with moths. Okay. Um, so mycorrhizal that means sort of they share or steal nutrients from each other. Um, so they've got a special symbiotic relationship. So it's a fungus, a mushroom that's got a special relationship with a particular type of moth. And I've discovered that there's quite a few of them. Um, and this one that I found, it was a um, bit of Grange Gardens in Staffordshire, just out, out with the kids. I got one photo of it because it was like, Mom, come on, hurry up. Yeah. Um, and um, so I got one picture of it. I just shoved a chunk of it in my pocket and brought it home to, to look at it under the scope. And like I said, I had a look in the fungi of temperate Europe, which is like my Bible. Um, and it wasn't in there, couldn't find it. So I put it out there online. And um, this uh, mycologist and bryologist, so mushroom guy, moss guy, um, on one of the perfect mosses. person for this one. Perfect person. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, oh, I want to be friends with you. <laughs> um, he, he said oh that looks really interesting can you send me can you send me a sample so off i trot with a bag of moss down to the post office and a day later he messages me to say i found an undescribed species there's there's no samples of it in q garden so it's getting dna sequenced and off it goes to q that's so exciting <laughs> do, do you have any impact uh, sorry influence over what it might be called like i think oh, i yeah. think it'd already be it's not undiscovered it's just okay. undescribed, so I just think that nobody really knows about it. Um, but my next question then is, like, is it a really rare fungus, or is it just so small and there's not enough nerdy people out there looking for it? Mm. Um, and that's that kind of then brings me back to foraging, because that's how I got into being this nature nerd. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I kind of that's where I want to go now with my teaching is that draw people in with the food and uh, then just turn them all into nerds. <laughs> I like I like nature nerd as a phrase. That's such a good, like, that's a, you know, I'm sure that Instagram handle is already gone, but no, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 no, I love that. Um, brilliant. Yeah. And, and it reminds me actually of, because I interviewed Jesper, um, yeah. your, the guy whose course yeah. you said you're on um, that first time around and, you know, he opened my eyes and said, because I thought initially with truffles, you know, obviously yeah. one of my things is truffles. You know, I thought there was only 20 to 30 species in the UK. He was the one that opened me up and said, actually, no, yeah. Ben, there's more like 90 plus. But I yeah. think a big part of that is because no one's looking. And these, mm-hmm. well, the same thing as you saying this moss thing is really small. Truffles obviously underground. So, yeah. you know, it's... people aren't looking and seeing these things. So there's so much to be discovered. And, and you just mentioned it, you know, you've, you potentially can go out there, get into foraging and discover brand new species yeah. and potentially get them, get your name somehow weaved into that as well, if, if, if yeah. that was even part of the combo. Exciting. Very uh, exciting. Yeah. So um, a question I wanted to ask you is for those uh, for those people who are listening who maybe they've come on to this podcast or they're watching this on YouTube for the very first time, and they're not really into foraging yet, but they've heard of it and think it's interesting, like, how would you explain what wild food foraging is and and why it's important and why it's important to you um so it's it's i mean it's the best thing ever (laughs) um it's it's good on so many levels like mental health wise you know just going out in the woods has helped me no end um especially like in the last six months um because i wish i took a a bit of a dive after a, a rather toxic relationship um and um it's just being out there feeling the wind on your face and and seeing all the green things and foraging helps you to to lift layers of green blindness um as a forager you might not get it yourself but for somebody who's never foraged and i get a lot of people saying this on my courses that i didn't realize how much stuff there is out there mm. And and by foraging and learning all the different plants and even just looking, I mean, the way I forage is I look for different shapes and different shades of green. And that is how I spot all the different species. Or if it's fungus, I look for circles. Um, 
so by by starting out foraging and, and going out with the mindset of looking at the green stuff you're taking that green blindness off you're seeing more than just oh it's a tree oh it's grass oh it's this um so that is a really important way of helping you to reconnect with nature this whole reconnecting thing seems to be a big thing at the moment mm. um I, I i've been doing all these things for years and just, oh that, that, that's not what everybody does do you not just go out and find a nice patch of moss and lie in it and look at a tree apparently that's nature bathing <laughs> that's what i do just because that's what i like doing um so yeah so you've got all those like fantastic mental health things that you get from foraging you get an exercise and then you get in like food um and i love the the, the quite childish and, and i love the the whole treasure hunt so the food the plants the mushrooms are the treasure and i also really like puzzles so it's it's the fun of getting at home and going right what is this let's look through books let's try and you know like one of the escape room type things you've got you know 60 minutes to identify this plant and eat it and and you know it might be alive at the end might not <laughs> um but then it's like so you you've gone out and you've seen stuff and then you go out again and then you t try it you, you're exercising another sense you know how often do you go out for a walk and use your taste buds unless you've got coffee with you you don't so it's it's another way of that connection. You know, you walk through a, a field of wild garlic and you're like, oh, garlic stinks. Taste it, and it's like, oh, you know, for me, it's like, oh, I've missed that. I've not I've not had that since June. Um, yeah, yeah. I had my first little taste of it the other day, and it was just like, oh, pesto pasta, wild garlic pesto pasta. It just brought brought it all back, and it's like, I can't wait. <laughs> um, so you know, it's 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 exercising your senses. You know, you sight, you smell, you taste, if it's safe to taste. Um, and even feel and texture, you know, you're, you're, you're using your senses, you're kind of connecting with your, um, like, humanness. It's not the word I wanted to use, but, you know, do you know what I mean? Where it's, um, you're going back to being not modern day man, but like Neolithic man, where we're like relying on, all of these senses for survival um and um getting back in tune with with being alive rather than just having a phone in front of you or you know sat watching the telly you're connecting with everything around you um and it really really makes you appreciate like where food comes from and the delicate balance of what we do um and I'm really starting to become aware of the impact, um, you know, sort of no, no, no food we eat is impact free. Um, you know, I don't want to get in the whole veganism argument, but no food we eat is impact free. Yeah. Um, and by foraging compassionately, sustainably, by being aware that every mushroom you take is a habitat for, for insects which are then useful for pollinating um that's obviously then going to have a, a an impact on on the fruit you know, so everything you do is having an impact and by being aware of that um it then makes you appreciate things a lot lot more so you know you look at your plate of food and you go i've collected that i've cooked it and i'm going to eat it and I put all the effort in rather than just nipping down the supermarket, get in the microwave meal, ping it in, and there it is. Um, so, so yeah. much more rewarding, right? Yeah, it's a, exactly. a really um, beautiful answer you just gave to, to what is, you know, quite a big question. I really appreciate how you answered that. It was great. And it reminded me as well, I was, you were triggering all these experiences that, you know, um, the last time that we were together, we were it was uh, shadowing you on a foraging course, right? Yeah. You know, obviously things didn't pan out for me and, and that company, but whatever. Um, uh, we also had Flavor Fred, George, on, yeah. on that as well, which was, you know, he's another great guy, mind blown. But it was, yeah. uh, it was just a walk of flavors. You know, we're eating like the needles. But the one that really blew my mind was um, 
and I might have got this completely wrong, but at least this is how I remembered it, was the immature uh, Rowan Berry seed pod things that then we nibbled on them. And you're like, yeah, nibble yeah. on this and tell me what flavour you find. Yeah. And it was like a, like an, an aftertaste, like a really sweet, nice aftertaste of marzipan. Mm-hmm. And which yeah, I was yeah, just like, flowers. just just crazy. Because yeah. like there's all the, and how many other plants and mushrooms you know uh, yeah. but plants definitely like have they have they got this like unique flavor which maybe yeah. we knew about years ago yeah. and just have forgotten about because you know there's a mass-produced ingredient yeah. that grows much quicker more efficiently in god knows where and we just import it type of thing but yeah yeah i really love that and um yeah yeah i've just i've just put out um an advert for, for some courses. Um, I was doing one in my village from uh, raising money for my local school, and one of the villagers I put on a picture of uh, a basket full of plants, and one of the villagers says it looks great for rabbits. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. please, please come on my course because I really want to change your mind about that because people who haven't forest just don't realise the the difference of flavour, and that's what blew me away when I first started. It was like, oh, it's all just going to taste like grass, isn't it? Um. And to add, grass doesn't all taste the same. Some grass tastes amazing. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's just the variation. You know, you, like you say, you've got marzipan, you've got citrus. Um, if you go down like the pines, you've got all the different lemons, grapefruits, oranges. Um, you've got sorrel, leafy citrus. You get irony. You get oh, it's just there's so many different flavors. Herby. Um, like mugwort's one of my favourite plants that just tastes gorgeous. Um, Do you yeah, have that? Yeah. Uh, because one of my things is um, I, I'm very interested in the plant side of things as well, and I like those little flavour hits and stuff. Mm. But obviously, I'm way more obsessed with mushrooms. But I think part of it is because sometimes I'm a bit like, all oh, these plants are all just a bit. They have like a bit of flavour in there, but then they're just a bit greeny and leafy, and yeah. just not really doing it for me. But I know there's probably a way to like find how to eat that specific thing at its like maximum potential and I was like do you have any good examples of whereby because I know when you go around and you you ask people to taste like for me you know like uh what's it um uh garlic mustard the the yeah. you know, that one for me that's and I think you said even before that's like, it's like a love it love or hate type yeah. of uh, flavor but as that example maybe there's an example where you can eat that particular leaf or another example if you've got a better one in one way and it's like "Mm, yeah but then you do it in a different way or accompanied with something else it's like Like, have you got any examples of like yeah i mean like that all of it all of it it. a lot lot of people go how long have you got ben (laughs) a lot of people come on the courses and they're like "Mm, oh it's a bit bitter um or oh it's a bit overpowering and stuff and it is, it's all about using the flavour. You wouldn't go out there and eat a handful of parsley or coriander. Most people wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and there's a out there, Herb Robert, uh, Stinky Bob, best name ever. Uh, yeah. It's part of the geranium family. It is, it'll be within 500 metres of your house. It's a prolific weed. Yeah. Um, and that tastes really strongly of, of coriander. Um, and on its own, just to eat it out of the ground, it is a bit like, oh, God. Uh, but if you chop that up in a salad of all the other different wild greens um, mm. or put it over the top of your curry or anything where you use coriander, um, I make a really nice um, cucumber and herb rubber writer with it. Um, you know, just split it all up. And it is lovely. Um, and it's it's very much a case of remembering that nature is like the supermarket. Mm. And you wouldn't go to the supermarket buy one ingredient and therefore have a plate of food yeah um you know they are individual ingredients that you then have to process and do stuff to make make yourself a meal um so with all of the wild greens themselves you can just eat them on their own as a salad but mix them up Mm. you know mix your jack by the head your garlic mustard your herb robert your cow parsley even wild garlic sorrel dandelion leaves just mix it all up, chop it all up, and then cover it with a bit of dressing, and it's the best salad you'll ever taste. Um, I think 
the way we run courses where you go, oh, you know, try this leaf. It, it can put some people off because on their own, they are a bit, oh, okay, because we're not used to having sort of more bitter flavours. All of our salads and our vegetables have been selectively bred to be sweet. I mean, when I was a kid, it could just be I've got older and more used to bitter flavours, but other people have said the same. I hated cauliflower. It was bitter and disgusting, but now actually it's really sweet. And that's through, you know, generations of um, selective breeding to get the sweeter flavours because we have become really accustomed to sweet, sugary things because that's what we like. It's quick energy. Um, I was um, having a chat a couple of uh, years ago with a a lady who was all about nutrition and gut biome. And okay. she was saying that humans' guts haven't actually evolved since we were Neanderthals. Um, so it's actually the bitter stuff that's really good for us and the sweet stuff. Well, our, our ancient ancestors would have maybe got a tablespoon a year of sugar. Um, and now I could probably say I've eaten that in a breakfast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it is. it took me a long time of regularly eating wild food to go, actually, my taste buds are getting used to and really enjoying these more bitter flavours. Mm. Um, but any sort of processing, um, you know, or playing around with the flavours is going to make it way better than just eating it straight out of the ground. Um, I mean, there are plants out there that I will eat straight out of the ground, like sorrel. Um, and I do like a little nibble on cacao parsley, but ground elder, that's, that's my favourite. I have actually planted that in my garden. Probably going to live to regret it, but I love that stuff. I was going to ask never, you a question actually. On, not on I'll not on ground it. elder. Sorry to interrupt you. The yeah. um, when you said planted in your garden, I you know we all go crazy for wild garlic. Me yeah. also, and I know you're a big fan. And I I was adamant that I was going to try and get some. And I know there's like a long life cycle to like them seeding. I think you told me that like six yeah. years. Is that right? Six or seven years from six, seed years. to a plant that then is then mature enough to flower and produce more seeds. Right. So I I was I went somewhere where there was producing seeds, yeah. stole some seeds and then tried to sprinkle them and plant them in the garden. So far, no luck. I don't yeah. know if you've known anybody who's had success taking seeds and uh not for, well, them about or not that I'm aware of. Um I have I have I hope that no coppers are listening. <laughs> um I have, with permission, um, taken it from bulb and let it do its own thing that way. Um, oh, and I think yeah. that's kind of the way of doing it. Um, just let it... only with the land owner's land yeah, owner's, land owner's permission, permission. Ladies yeah, and gents. Definitely. He said it was okay. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So um, I planted that. I first of all planted it in the pot because I was like, oh, God, oh, this is going to go crazy. And yeah. now I'm just like, actually, I wanted to go crazy. So I planted it in a, in a shady spot in my garden. Um, and it's been there for about three years now. Um, so there are mature bulbs and they flowered and, and dropped the seeds. Um, and because I think they've sat there in the ground where they're supposed to be so that, you know, they get the right conditions for germinating. I yeah. had last year's little tiny ones and the, the first year seeds are only about an inch tall. Um, oh. How cute! So uh, yeah, kill some bulbs. <laughs> so let's let's talk wild garlic recipes. I know you said wild garlic pesto. Is there is there anything else that either you've done in the past that you mm. love, or yep. you've got on your agenda to do because you've seen seen a recipe or something like that? I'd love to get one um, or two golden nuggets. Yeah. Out of you. So I mean, the best way of preserving wild garlic is lacto fermenting. So if you try and dry it, it loses mm. its flavour. If you freeze it, it goes mushy after a couple of months in the freezer. So lacto ferment is where you blitz it up, you cover it with sort of between three and five percent salt, um, and then you just it lives forever and gets more umami, garlicky, yummy. Um, so sorry, just to detail that. So you blitz it up in a blender, mm -hmm. and then you make like a, a water solution with no, no, said. no, just just pure salt. Just cover so it in just, salt, massage just, it with salt, and then put it in a jar. Okay. And that's it. So when you say two or three percent, you're weighing the weight of the yeah. 
the yeah, um so if you've got like a hundred grams of um well garlic you want uh two or three grams of yeah five type of thing five ten grams of salt something like that ten might be too much so five grams of salt and then you just sort of really massage it around and then put it in the jar and um and leave it um and then the salt draws out the liquid it kills all by the lactilia bacteria um so it goes through this fermentation process and it's too salty for for anything else then to grow um and what's and that good to eat with I just, that, that you like everything. just everything yeah just everything i use it instead of garlic cloves in um in a bolognese or, or whatever um mm. put it in risotto put it on a cracker with cheese <laughs> um but what i've also done with it so last year um for the company I worked with, um, we made a, a dustbin full of lacto garlic, um, oh and we were portioning it up for events. And at the bottom, there was just all of this garlic juice, um, and I, I was no way I was wasting that. Oh, <laughs> um, so uh, I bottled all that up, and most and people I, would be I, like, <laughs> "Probably." Oh, it was amazing. Um, so uh, it is quite salty, but then I've mixed it even more with with salt. I've mixed it with some soy. Okay. Soy sauce, lacto fermented bar garlic soy sauce. Oh, is that a winner? That's a winner. That's like you know when you go to a posh restaurant and they just put like three or four dots of something tasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. amazing. <laughs> I, the um, good thing about doing that type of thing as well is it's preserved as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that, I, I found that wild garlic does actually keep quite well in the fridge anyway. But yeah, like, if you put it in a Tupperware or something, then it'll keep for a couple of weeks. But I, 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 I think preserving the foods in in smart ways like that and, and yeah. i think yeah i think this is going to be the year where i'm really gonna i did one or two fermenting experiments last yeah. year but i think this year i want to do more like 10 or 15 yeah but, um, yeah um, and how else how else about uh the wild garlic then um, not lacto so, fermenting it? so if you're not lacto fermenting it um you can make little capers uh like pickled capers from the from either the, the flower heads or from the, mm. the seeds um or um george um george has a very nice recipe for um fred, uh, fred and george is it fred and george no flavor fred that's the guy i'm after uh, Flavor fred um, called george yeah called george yeah <laughs> um he Sorry. um shout out yeah shout out <laughs> um he makes a really nice wild garlic salt um mm. so i can't remember his exact recipe but, but look him up and then steal his recipe because it, it's a little bit like pickled onion munch for munch. Mm. Um, mm, I remember nice. what did I swap him? I swapped him like a jar of birch sap syrup for this salt, and it was <laughs> very nice. <laughs> that was nice. Um, yeah, just just put it in everything. Um, so use it instead of of um like actual commercial garlic. Um, so I just chop it up and and put it in all of my cooking. Um, the kids get to the point where they're like, "Mom, stop putting garlic and stuff." <laughs> Um, but yeah, this year, um, I really want to try and play around with, um, like my own cheeses. Um, it's got a, a raw milk farm at the end of the road. Um, nice. so I want to try and make some garlic cheese, um, uh, which is, that's on my radar this year. So do you have like the, what, what equipment will you start with to do that? Um, well, to be honest, I'm going to start off with a, a really basic, uh, wild garlic cream cheese because that's, that's nice and easy. Um, okay. I went to a, a, a there's a, a retief college not far away, and they do um, all sorts of uh, studies with the kids, and they have open days, um, and they were getting you to make um, like butter and, and cheese there, and I've, I've got the recipe. Don't know how to do it off the top of my head. I'm waiting for the garlic to come around, and then I'll look at the piece of paper on how to do it that's somewhere on the notice board. <laughs> Um, so I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but yeah, so that I'm guessing I'm just going to like chock up a load of garlic and just mix it in with cream cheese and let it sit for a bit. Or well, I might play around with the, with the lacto just to really give that um, umami garlic flavour. Because with, with the lacto, um, instead of like, you know, one or two leaves, it's a handful of leaves. Um, because obviously it shrivels down and it, it becomes kind of this garlic mush. 
Mm. Um, so you've got a lot more intense, like, whoa, garlic. <laughs> Vampires will leave you alone. Just go wash it, wash, watch your breath around talking <laughs> close to people and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, I was going to ask you, um, you've got kids, right? A couple of, couple yeah. of kids, or how many have you got? Two. Two. Ten and, and six. Ten and six. And what are their names? Amelia and Beck. Beck. And I was going to ask you, um, do they are they interested in the wild food foraging side of things? Have they taken? Are they under your wing in that respect? Or like... <laughs> they are. They are. They're getting there. Um, they're both quite fussy eaters, and I blame that entirely on their dad. <laughs> okay, yeah. But they will. They they love chicken nuggets nice. and chips type of thing. Or um, oh, I mean, no, yes, but no. <laughs> I mean, they would they would always choose that unless I'd say, you know, should we have ramen for tea or something like that? Okay. Um, but it, if it's green, they're not entirely sure about it. It's still, I'm still working on them. But they will, they will come out and they will try things that I give them, and they're like, "Oh yeah, it's really nice." And then I put it on the plate, and they're like, "What's this green stuff?" <laughs> oh, you wait. In the... So I don't know if they say they like it just to make me happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they, they absolutely love finding new stuff. Um, mm. you know, even uh the other day i took my my son to the swimming pool and there's a, a bit of grass outside the pool he's like mommy i found a mushroom for you <laughs> and he just he gets this little high from finding me a mushroom and then i tell him about it and and whatnot so it's getting i'm getting there slowly um i think if you're starting this young it won't be long before they're yeah. full-blown addicted into it but yeah i mean i have their necks every time they walk through the yeah. woods <laughs> yeah i mean with with my daughter um I can't actually take her out on on walks anymore when I've got people with me as a as an actual walk because she'll she'll just butt in and just start doing my job for me. So I oh, it, it I has see. it has gone in. <laughs> yeah, it has gone in, but I'm not entirely sure how how much she enjoys it. Whether it's just uh, I'm doing it because mummy likes it. Yeah. Um, but um, her favourite teacher at the moment does have mushrooms on it, so I'm calling that a win. <laughs> yeah, that's a massive win. That is, that is cool. Yeah. Nice. So, so um, I was also going to ask you, what are, what are uh, some of the, the challenges, I guess, that you've faced as a wild food forager and, and how have you overcome them? Um, well, I'll be honest, I'm quite lucky. Um, I've never really had any. Um, I mean, I quite often get people saying, oh, what are you picking? Um, what are you going to do with it? And, and, and I just then go into excited. Somebody's asked me about it. I can talk about wild food. And they just get really interested. And quite often I can feed random strangers leaves and they just blindly trust me, which I think is hilarious <laughs> because, you know, I could be giving them hemlock. <laughs> and they just go, oh, oh, yeah, I'll try it. And, and, and yeah. Um, so yeah i've not really come across any um i mean where i am in cheshire um i've bumped into a few foragers um but i don't there's there's one patch over in the peak district where i know it's it's quite well foraged and and delamere forest um and they are becoming more and more popular uh, Mm because they are particular course venues um and and so i just i go elsewhere and and find different patches and better patches and whatnot but thankfully it's not like down at the new forest or epping forest where there's bands and there doesn't seem to be hordes of commercial foragers coming around here at, at the moment but obviously i know i know it happens i have commercially foraged myself um and that 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 was a very swift education of mm. um on on how to do it right and i think it is a fine line obviously you've got to be really respectful of of the sustainability aspect and i think it can be done um sustainably uh, and then going back to the wild garlic um when i first started commercial foraging I mean, it was asked for 100 kilos of wild garlic it was like okay well this is going to take forever um mm. so i just i just went in and i cut a big square and then i went back the year later and i was like oh last year when i cut this big square there was loads of those little tiny 
you know, new shoots. And there aren't any this year. Why is that? Oh, Mumpkins is taking everything. You know, I've taken all the flowers and all the seeds, so obviously it's not going to regenerate. Mm. Um, and that 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 hurt. I felt bad for that, but obviously I was just starting out as a sort of serious foraging side and, and getting big quantities. So I adapted my practice and the woods that I had permission to, to forage from, I just cut a path. So as, mm. as wide as me, crawled through with a bag behind me. Um, you know, it, when you're doing it commercially, it is really hard to just, you know, pick a few leaves out. Um, and that is the most sustainable way for, for you know, the bull needs those leaves to create sugars and energy. If you take the whole lot, then um, it, it's really going to damage the bulbs. So I just cut like a you know, 30 centimetre wide path through this woods, just meandering all around. I couldn't tell you a year later where I'd be. Um, and That's quite cool. often, actually, picking it early enough and you couldn't tell couple of weeks later where you'd been either because it would bounce back and come back um you know so i know there is a lot of controversy with with the whole is it sustainable is it not and everybody's got their own arguments and i'm sort of mm. i'm in the middle of you know it can it can be done sustainably with a lot of care and effort um and i think if i ever did go back to commercial harvesting i'd be even more considerate and spend even more time doing it and just take a few leaves from each plant um, now that obviously I'm more aware of the life cycle and the fact that other things rely on it and, and just yeah it's that whole impact thing again I think that's a really um a really good story you shared there and very honest and uh, thank you and I think it's, it's obviously one of the underlying messages that I guess I'd like to shout about is is yeah. you know I'm striving to get loads of attention for foraging and, and all yeah. this sort of stuff. And so is many other people. And it is obviously a, a rising tide of interest. Yeah. But obviously with that is going to be the, the, the danger is everyone's going to go out in the woods and like chop this, chop that, fill yeah. their bags, fill their bags. And then suddenly it's going to be like, okay, this is a bit crazy now. So yeah. Um, little tips and continuing, continuing to repeat the message about, yeah sustainability because i know there's no like there's no like and i know there's a few people that i've seen online who are working towards like uh some sort of um not rules but like i don't even know what the phrase is like governance advice suggested mm -hmm. standardized practice for how to yeah. forage sustainably and safely and effectively and maybe i'll speak to those people in on the podcast at some time but yeah. um yeah i mean there's um there's an association of foragers out there mm. um I've just been to to the meetup last weekend. I've just about recovered from from the lack of sleep oh, yeah. and whatnot. <laughs> um, uh, was there some um, foraged alcohol beverages going on there? there was an awful <laughs> lot of foraged alcohol beverages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll ask you that question in a second. But oh, sorry, thank you. Yeah, don't get don't get hangovers, but um, yeah. Oh god. Uh, um, but yeah, they um, if you check out their website, um, all the people within the association adhere to the principles of practice. Mm. Um, and it's all, all up there their main goals are sustainability and safety mm. um, and it's it's the whole thing like um, it's like being the first person to a buffet table you know you've got all the people behind you so you're kind of a little bit more liberal about how much you put on your plate and you, I, I kind of think you should have the same mindset when you're going into foraging that you know there is all that food there ripe for the taking but if you take it all then the people the insects the wildlife that's coming after you even even yourself if you want to go back for another handful later you know if you take it all the first time you go, oh look on instagram you've got you know, this massive pile of mushrooms or all these leaves and all this you know if you take it all there's nothing then to go back to for you or anyone else so so go at it like you're going to the buffet table for the first time <laughs> um and it is it is that whole um the, the more you respect what you're taking the more you then become an ambassador for that patch of land mm. um you know let let's let's strip it all out and put concrete on it said so no forager ever um you know, we are 
the people that are going to be fighting to to stop councils or whoever ripping out trees and hedgerows and whatnot. I mean, I, I, I was mortified last year when somebody felled all my elderflower trees. Um, you know, hopefully they'll bounce back, but it's going to take a couple of years. Mm. Um, and it's it's it is the foragers that are going to be looking after the land. I mean, I always go out with a carrier bag for food and a, well, a basket for food and a carrier bag for litter. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it makes me sad that it takes me half an hour to pick a basket full, but ten minutes to fill a carrier bag. Hmm. Um. So and, actually, uh, talking about that, actually, as as we were talking about mental health earlier. If anyone wants like a easy mental health exercise to do, go and pick up some rubbish from around the, your neighbourhood. And yeah. uh, oh, I mean, I find, I I find that actually times. more depressing. <laughs> do you? Oh no! Well, I think I'm you've done a good really deed. Depressed. I've done a good <laughs> deed, yes. But whilst I'm in the act of picking up litter, it makes me yeah, angry. Like, yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I don't understand how people could do it. I mean, I'm I'm probably guilty of of having something in my pocket, pulling something out else out, and not noticing like a, a a wrapper or something dropping on the floor but when you go and you see beer cans and wine bottles and it's just i don't get it you carried all that stuff there it's lighter on the way back take it with you yeah it drives me insane um and it's quite often the foragers that find the random stuff in the uh in the woods um i found <laughs> i found a couple of years ago so i was uh commercially harvesting in mac forest i was picking wood sorrel that takes a long time. So you've really become sort of aware of your surroundings. And um, there was a a mound with a stick in it, you know, like human human length mound with a stick in it. And I was like, okay, somebody's clearly just, you know, buried the dog in the woods. It's the favourite dog walking space. Um, and then a couple of months later, a second mound appeared next to it, same length, stick in it. Okay, maybe they had two dogs, you know, one goes, the other one goes. And then a little bit later, those mounds had gone and there were two big drag marks <laughs> leading away from these mounds. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's the foragers that also find the random stuff in the woods. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> mean, that is a weird one. Um, oh, another one down, uh, it's actually Go in on. my village. Um, at the bottom of the village, we've got a, a river and a really good scarlet elfcut patch. Yeah. And I was down there four years ago now. Uh, collecting elf cups, and I found this china doll head. I was like, okay, that's scary. Uh, took it home with me because I've got a friend who who's into that kind of stuff. Um, the following year, I found a leg. Didn't think any more of it. Just, you know, okay, obviously the whole doll was here at some point, and that's the leg, and I missed that last year. And then last year, I found a doll in her entirety. She was nice and clean and, and just, just there. Um, oh, I left her there. She's still there, and I, I, I gave her an offering of, of some mushrooms when uh, I went down to pick. So, yeah, so I call her the molten voodoo doll. Yeah, there's something <laughs> going on there, isn't there? Someone's got a, a, a interesting hobby going on. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I forgot where, what the question was now. No, no, it's really, <laughs> we were just meandering down the river of conversation. It was all good. Um, so mushrooms then. I know yes. you're a big mushroom fan. Um, <laughs> so many questions to ask, and I know you wouldn't easily be able to narrow it down, I'm sure, but what are a couple of your favourite mushrooms? Uh, I think specifically to go out and forage for. Um, we'll get on to maybe eating and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah. Um, what, what... Oh God. <laughs> and you can break it up by yeah. season if that helps. Okay. Well, I mean... I think a belit is always good to find. Yeah. Um, I, I'm much. Can you more explain what a belit is for like? So people? a belit is um, a genus of mushrooms that have pores instead of gills. Um, it's actually one of the easiest genuses to to identify because of having this pore surface 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 surface. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Um, you know, when when you when you find your mushrooms. You're looking at your cap and your stem mushrooms, which are like your typical supermarket button ones. If you pick it and turn it over and it's got pores, well, you're pretty much 
at your genus, there's only a couple of other polypores and things that it could be if it's not a bleat. Um, so that genus, as far as my aware, it's like 70 odd different ones in the UK, and there's only four that are toxic. Mm. So it's quite a quite an easy genus to to forage from. Um, are they deadly toxic, or are they like? Uh, <laughs> Satan's Belief, the Devil's Belief, which I've never seen. I'd like to. It likes chalky soil. So it's sort of yourself down. Yourself yeah. down. Down Traffic south patches. somewhere. Yeah. Crap up geography. And um uh I don't it's it's not it's not a death cap. Um, but I don't think it's gonna make you very happy. Yeah. Um I I'm not entirely sure if there have been any deaths from it but i know it's the one that um if i'm out foraging and i find a mushroom with any red on it and um uh I, there's a couple of eastern europeans that i see and they're like no no not the red ones don't touch the red ones it's the devil's belief so they're all terrified of it um but with the beliefs a really good rule is if there's any red or blue so if the mushroom's got any red anywhere on it, so red cap, red paws, red stem, or if you bruise it or cut it, it turns blue. Red and blue could make you spew. Okay, nice. So That's great, a good one. great little tip there to sort of remember them. But it it's could. So the scarlatina belief, that's a lovely red pawed mushroom um with a, a lovely red pattern on the stem. And that does turn blue and Sorry, I'm probably going to offend a lot of people. I think they're nicer than Porcini. Oh, really? Um, I find even even with the really big ones, they're a lot firmer. I don't do soggy mushrooms. Um, I like. Do you, would you eat the spore layer as well when they're big I and mature the like that? Yeah. You eat the whole lot. Whole lot. Fry it up till it's crispy, or you know, just put it in a stew or risotto or whatever. Um, I did I did last year try and jerky some as well. That was it was interesting. It wasn't as good as beefsteak jerky. Um, and that's actually just reminded me that the beefsteak mushroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it it kind of goes back to your, your plant question, actually. Um, so beefsteak mushroom, I, I found one years ago and I, I mm. fried it up and it was disgusting. Yeah. It was really sort of bitter and like almost vinegary. Acidic, yeah. Oh, I had yeah, really experience. acidic. It was horrible. And I can't remember who it was, otherwise I'd, I'd give you a shout out. But somebody on social media um, made jerky with it. I, I love. I think jerky. I think it might have been uh, our good mate, Flavor Fred George, again, because I'm pretty sure I've seen him do something like that. Yeah. Um, anyway, and we'll give him another yeah, shout out. Yeah, George. <laughs> <laughs> George is awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I got I found I found one uh, in the autumn. And brought it home, covered it with some like garlic, smoked paprika, a little bit of chili, um, and let it marinate. Or sliced it really thinly, let it marinate um, for about an hour, and then they popped it in the Is dehydrator. That a dry, a dry marinade you did there on the thin slices. Yeah, yeah. So just like a dry rub. Right. Yeah. Of of spices, um, and then I just chucked it in the dehydrator for a couple of hours, and oh my god, I had to put the jar of this stuff in my car because otherwise I would have just sat and eat it, eaten it in one go. Wow. But it lived it lived in my boot and I just I just shared it and ate it a lot whilst I was driving. <laughs> it was like the ultimate MSG and just oh, it was so addictive. So I'm now like actually beefsteak fungus is amazing. <laughs> I'm convinced you just sold me on it. I was I was always yeah, a bit like, right. Oh, it's a good one to find and look at, but no, I've... no, no. No, um, I had a similar experience with um it was only last year that I ate my first parasol and yeah. uh oh my gosh like nice mind it's blown going. it's it's yeah. way up there in my top it, you know last year at least it was probably my favorite mushroom because what I did yeah. was um I think recipe straight out of the oh gosh mind blank um you know the river cottage guy John yeah. John John Wright. John with John White uh, straight out of his so cut it up, soak them in milk, uh, seasoned flour, and I also got fancy and did some spiced seasoned flour. Then dusted them in that, and then shallow fat fried in oil. And oh yeah. my god, yeah. dip those in whatever dip you want. And oh, yeah. they were heaven. <laughs> um, Breaded so. mushrooms or deep fried mushrooms, 
are amazing. So uh, we're just up at the association and I made um, a wild katsu curry with um, panko king oyster mushrooms. Oh yeah, nice. Uh, there was none left. <laughs> did it you have somewhere. how did you have how did you cut the uh oysters were they i just the sliced them in half and sliced them in half them in, yeah and just panko bread crumbs and deep fried them and that's such a good shout <laughs> um it's also really good with either chicken of the woods or um puff balls okay yeah uh they're both really good bread crumbed and, and deep fried I've never been much of a puffball eater but i think i just need to be a bit more uh daring it, um it, it is it's it's another one of those soggy ones, but again, if, if you give it some crunch, yeah, you know, you know schnitzels or or anything like that, then actually it is really good. Um, what other mushrooms do I love? Uh, I think my favourite one to eat is a trooping funnel. Okay, They've yeah. got such a good flavour and such a good texture, especially if you just slightly burn them. Um, slightly burn really, them, nice. You know, you know, when you get like kind of caramelised. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah brown bit oh and the crunchy yeah very really you good. find um they're better when they're uh young uh mid middle-aged or like mature or it doesn't matter um well with the with the um tubing funnel the stem is incredibly tough and fibrous mm. um almost to the point where you can't really chew it so i just eat the caps okay so um you know when they're when they're mature the it's immature sorry the caps are really small so I tend to leave them so they get um, you know, as big as your hand, and then then I'll pick them. Um, what else? Winter mushroom. It's got to be scarlet elf cup. Um, okay, yeah. And we have we have just had uh, chocolate coated scarlet elf cups from uh, Charlotte Flower Chocolates. That's another Insta oh, nice. page to go and look up. Um, so yeah, she just she just dunked these elf cups raw um, in. In some dark chocolate, and wow, they were good. <laughs> um, but my favorite thing to do with those is to make uh, bacon, so oh, mushroom yeah. bacon, because you fry them up and they kind of, because of the color of them, they kind of look bacony. Um, so I put a bit of like smoked paprika and a little bit of soy just to give you that kind of bacony flavor, and then just on a sandwich with uh, some lettuce or, or dandelions and. and I don't like tomatoes, so I go for mayonnaise. <laughs> and that Very that's nice. really good. Really, really good. I'm a bit sad because I don't I haven't I mean I've looked, but um in I mean I've only been living here two two and a half years now, but no no patches around here. Oh. Well, the last time I found a decent patch was in, in, in the valleys in Wales. Yeah. But um what are we looking for to find these these because obviously this is one of the few nice findables in this, yeah. this time of year in winter. But what are we in? Yeah. We're in uh, End you're, looking of February for now. you're looking for looking moss. For moss. <laughs> so you're looking for damp um patches. It likes willow, um, but I have seen it on on ash and, and a few other things. Um so you know when you get sort of these damp, boggy areas where your branches have fallen down and then they've become covered in moss. Hmm. That's your sort of key habitat for an elf cup. Um okay. you'll see them sort of shining red through the uh, through the mossy patches on the, on the branches or sometimes if a branch has got buried then you'll see it actually looking like it's coming from the ground nice. um but yeah damp damp boggy lots of wood on the floor um and, and moss <laughs> just made me think of a few locations i probably should go and check out near me so yeah. uh, no thanks yeah. for that. <laughs> it, and it is it's all about sort of seeing the habitat because i when I first want, well, first discovered elf cups, um, I was looking everywhere for them, but I was looking in the wrong place. Hmm. Um, um, a guy I knew took me to see his patch, and I'm like, oh, that looks like the river down by me. So I came home, went for a walk down the river, and there were thousands of them. Wow. Um, you know, I've 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 picked uh, about three kilos from down by the river and and you can still just see thousands of them um that was back when i was closely harvesting so yeah um hopefully now that i'm leaving them alone a bit more they'll go even more bunkers um okay. but yes yeah, so all about learning the habitat any others any others that are particularly uh, so you get excited about 
I mean, I'm really like I said, I'm really excited about the poisonous stuff. Yeah. Um, Why I've are you never... so excited about poisonous mushrooms? I was, I was a bit like oh, excited it's... about poison in general, to be honest. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, and just just the fact that like a tiny little molecule can just destroy your entire body. It just mm. blows my mind. Um, you know that it's it's just like why is the stuff in that that looks very similar to that so dangerous why does it mess you up so much it just it just fascinates me um uh but yeah so i would love and i've never found one but i'm hoping this is going to be the year i'd love to find one of the the big five you know like a death okay. cap or a destroying angel or a pants cap um or or like the deadly web cap or something like that i'd love to find just just found it and possibly have you, found, you found them before or you're just looking for no nope, uh, i've never i've never seen them the the only one i've ever found is the inus ibgf filler is it the the white fiber cap deadly fiber oh, i think i know what you mean yeah the, li- the little one that smells of sperm yeah um i find that a lot I find it in my garden <laughs> it does um spermicidal is what the uh the guidebooks say <laughs> oh is it oh really yeah oh, God. um it's uh one of the one of the key features for it is is the smell it's part of the reason why i love mushrooms i don't particularly like smelling spermy mushrooms but i love all the different smells <laughs> um so yeah i would love to find one of the one of the deadly ones and, and possibly be a little bit reckless i would love to lick a death cap <laughs> really um because it is because licking it can't actually yeah do anything, exactly right? but i just... think there's worldwide i think there's about two or three that are harmful to touch in the uk i oh, really are oh, didn't know there that. is there is nothing um recorded because <laughs> yeah. we're getting all sorts of foreigners coming in and and just ha- uh, naturalizing when you know like when people have plants from abroad and they've got the the mycelium in the in the rootstock and stuff um but yeah native uk fungi we've got nothing that is unsafe to touch it's all safe to touch and i don't re- recommend it uh, to beginners but it is all safe to to have a little nibble and a little taste um and then and then spit it out um it's it's particularly useful as a as an id feature for some mushrooms um especially in the the rushlet or lactarius the the milk cap genus um and the sort of safe rule is if it's spicy it could make you vomit and if it's mild then it's edible um so that's an interesting uh it's one way to impress your friends or make them think you're an absolute crazy person (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, I love it on courses, um, giving giving people a little nibble of a really spicy rushlet, and they're like, oh my god, how is it that hot? And it is, it's like putting a chilli on the tip of your tongue, I think it it triggers the same receptors as like the, is it capsicum in chilli? Um, that just make your body go, oh my god, that's hot. Um, so yeah, there are there are a couple of couple of good ones out there. Um, the, the peppery milk caps, one of my particular favourite, and I've got a, a friend who's from Romania, and yeah. they they eat them with the, this special cheese as a as a delicacy, and he's like, they're really spicy, but they're good. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, that also reminded me um, of the, the the saffron milk cap was always a mushroom which uh, for years I was like, you know, because it obviously it's orange, it yeah, stains, it has patches, it stains green, and it, it's not immediately something that uh, you would jump out and go, "Oh, that looks delicious," especially when it's been bruised. But um, yeah. I, I was I I tried it for the first time last last year, and oh my god, just yeah. unbelievably delicious and uh, oh, it's great texture, great texture, and it's um, like you preferred the uh, uh, what was it you said you preferred over the uh, the the scarlatina. Portini, the, the scarlatina yeah i think yeah. I pref- there's a lot of people in spain apparently they much prefer the saffron milk cap to the porcini for example yeah. which is which is yeah, the, and there's I loads think... of it growing near me so i'm quite happy about that yeah exactly it's it's a, it's one of those that um it's a lot more common because a lot of foreign foragers that um that are getting into mushrooms go bleach i can do them 
Yeah. Um, and they only take the brown ones. They leave all the, the you know the red ones. And then when you get like an orange mushroom, they're like, whoa, no way. It's got, it's <laughs> yeah. got to be poisonous. It's orange. Yeah. Um, so that the ones that or a red yeah. cat rustula that's good. Yeah, to control, exactly. But... Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, people get into it, just not too into it because <laughs> I don't want you to all learn the ones that I eat. <laughs> yeah. So on on that note, then for, and I'm sure you've been asked this question a lot of times, but if somebody wanting to get into mushroom foraging, complete beginner. Yeah. Where would you suggest that they start? And I'm guessing that might also be take a course which you know i agree yeah. with um but then like if they were then venturing out on their own type of thing what are some of the key things that they need to uh bear in mind or consider or where what mushrooms genuses should they yeah. focus on type of thing um i mean yeah take a course is the best way because books internet can't give you the smell or the taste because they're so subjective um I mean, saint george mushrooms to me smells like wet dog Everybody else says it's mealy, but no, it's wet dog. <laughs> um, you know, and I don't it, even know what mealy is. It's like wet weird. flour. Yeah, and that's the flour. thing. Like the books say, you know, mealy, and it's like, well, what? What is mealy? Yeah. Especially when do you, you last smell bake. wet flour? I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I don't. Maybe if I baked more. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted. Um, you. No, that's okay. Um, so um, I forgot what the question was. Beginner, beginner mushroom Beginners, tips. Yes. Take a course. Um, definitely, definitely Bit take one. a course or. or find somebody um i mean quite often um if you have a look at the the british mycological society mm. um it's obviously it's not foraging and a lot of the the mycologists are anti-foraging but you just don't tell them that bit sorry mycologists yeah. <laughs> um but the there's lots of groups all around the country uh, so i'm part of the northwest fungi group and the shropshire fungi group um and and you know they they lead walks just to to nerd out on mushrooms mm. um you know they won't talk to you about the edibility of them but you can learn your mushrooms that way and then if you do want to go and eat them then well you know it, you've got to do a lot of your own research and your own you know um finding stuff out um but yeah joining joining fungi groups is really good and also then if you do find something interesting then you can record it to them um and then it gets noted um and i hate to say it but social media um i mean it's 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 changed a lot since i first started um getting into mushrooms so so 2013 2014 there was a, a facebook group called mushroom foraging uk mm-hmm. um and there was about 400 of us and it was a lovely little group and it was great because you could see what mushrooms are popping up that week yeah because it's like you could just see everyone's post oh I found this oh I found this um and i played guess the shroom quite a lot so people would post a picture on saying what's this um and you'd look at the picture and scroll through the pictures and zoom in and just look at all the key features so what's going on with the cap are there any patterns and scales or, or whatever is it hairy greasy and then you'd look at the gills and you'd see how they're detached to the stem are they crowded have they got pores have they got spikes and all that stuff and then you look at the stem and hopefully there's a bit of habitat going on and and so i'd see if i could guess what it was before i actually looked at the comments to see what people said it was and i learned loads from doing that because what you start to see is the characteristics that make it that mushroom Mm. rather than just seeing a mushroom as a whole because they're really variable between how how old they are um you know you take a nip nip down to the supermarket buy yourself a button mushroom a closed cup mushroom and a flat mushroom and look at the differences Mm. because that is the same mushroom at three different stages of its life you know it's it when it's in its button stage it just it doesn't even look like it could even potentially have gills and then you get the close cut and you slice it in half and you see those two little white gills. And if you let it get a bit further, they turn, turn salmony pink and then they'd go chocolatey brown and eventually black. So you've got to look at the features that aren't the changing ones, but the ones that are always there. Hmm. Um, you know, it's like with a fly agaric. You've got to be mindful that those spots can wash off. 
Yeah. You know, and then you've got this reddish mushroom. Oh, could that be an orange grisette? Well, no, because if you look under the skirt, it, it, under the cap, it's got a skirt, so it can't be a grisette. It's got a skirt. Um, so it's it's learning those features, and and seeing beyond the variation. That's that's quite important. Um, I mean, mushroom foraging UK now has got like thousands and thousands of people in it, and it's it's. They do get a bit bitchy, so if you are just getting into it, um, find a local one or something. Find find a local one, or don't say, "Can I eat this?" Because otherwise, they'll just bombard you with hate. <laughs> oh gosh, really? Oh. Um, I so, like what you yeah. said there about the the groups, though, and seeing what's popping up because, yeah. um, obviously, from year to year, things pop up at different times, even yeah. in your location. But then. From location to location, like it pops up different times. I didn't realize that there was such a big difference in when general porcinis would pop up yeah, um, from, from Scotland, Scotland to down here. Down, yeah, it's 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 yeah. weird. I, I I don't know if you know, but I'd love to know. Like, was that a temperature thing, or is it? Yeah, just, highly likely it is just because yeah. obviously it's a bit cooler up there. Yeah, so they so they will start being cooler first. Scotland, and Scotland, it's wetter. Yeah. Um, you know, you're down in the south. Good luck, mate. <laughs> yeah well Danny, Danny's 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 mum and husband have just bought a place at the northwest coast of Scotland so we've got some future nice. future holidays up there nice uh, go go and end of August um and yeah is that's when I'm going and I'm hoping it's gonna be good um but yeah so social media you, you want you can't quite see that on the camera you want a shelf of books yeah um because every person who talks about mushrooms and how to describe them will tell you slightly differently. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we're, especially with some of the subjective features like the smell or the taste, everybody will say it slightly differently. Um, and so when I first started out, I, um, I had its, uh, where is it? This one. So oh, the yeah. Encyclopedia of Mushroom, the Great Encyclopedia of Mushrooms by Jean Louis Lemerson and Jean Pierre Police. Um and it's it is brilliant. Um, you know, and the thing I love about it the most is you've got the lookalikes in there. Yeah, there yeah, yeah. And that that was that was brilliant for me. And I I just stupidly thought, Oh well that's that's all the mushrooms in the country. I don't need to learn any others. Yeah. And now I have the two volumes of um, Temperate Europe. I mean, that that's one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it's okay. And yeah, it's like um, more than two thousand eight hundred species. Ah! <laughs> nice. Um. So what's in one book? probably won't be in another unless you buy something like the temperate europe books which are fabulous um so a number of books and just go out there and look for stuff go for a walk and, and find things um and and take off your layers of green blindness the more you start looking the more you find the more you'll learn and the quicker you'll learn um you know quite often you'll you'll find a patch and you'll just keep seeing the same mushroom over and over again. If you're in the same habitat, so say you're in a pine plantation or whatever, you'll keep seeing the same things popping up because they're all growing in the same area. The mycelium is under the ground spreading around, so it's stretching quite far and wide, and then the spores are coming out, and they're landing and going a little bit further. So, you know, in, in one area, you can find lots of the, the same species. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important if you want to get into mushrooms is to learn your trees. Trees are really important because that's your, your mycorrhizal stuff. Um, so I sort of, if you were to give a beginner's tree lesson for mushroom foraging, what, what would you share with them? Uh, if you're looking for mushrooms in a sycamore or an ash wood, you're lost. <laughs> yeah. No mushrooms. Um, yeah. So you, your top three, uh, well, top four are beech and oak um and they will give you a vast range of different species of mushrooms but not always 
quantity of those species. Um, whereas if you go to birch and coniferous, so pine, spruce and, and fir forests, you're getting fewer species, but more of those species. That makes sense. That's brilliant. Yeah, no, no, I've not heard um, anyone describe it like that before. And so really as, as a beginner, I would recommend hunting under birch and hunting under coniferous trees because mm. you're more likely to find stuff. It's a little bit disheartening when you come home with an empty basket. Um, so, you know, you're more likely to find stuff um, like a brown birch belete says what it is on the tin. It's brown. It's growing with a birch tree. And it's a bleat, so it's a mushroom with the spongy pores. And you, usually if you find one of those, you'll find about 20, um, which is then really good because it goes back to my thing about seeing it in all its different variations. Mm. You know, so you'll see all oh, the little baby ones, you'll see big old soggy ones, you know, so you'll see them all in their different variations within that habitat. Whereas if you go to a, um, uh, an oak or a beech wood, you're just going to see thousands of different types of mushrooms and just be like, whoa, too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I always tell people, start off with three, maybe four genuses. Start off with beliefs. Uh, start off with agaricuses. Start off with puffballs and brackets, like um, chicken of the woods or something like that. Um, because those, those three genus are your safest three. Yeah. Um, obviously, with your elites, it's your red and your blue will make your spew rule, which helps you to whittle out all the poisonous ones and some really good edibles. But you know, if you I get, guess yeah, I, I haven't you get your ID this, wrong. But there's the bitter belete, right? That I guess wouldn't fall into that category. Yeah, the bitter belete wouldn't one you want fall to into that either. category. <laughs> but it's not going to do you any harm if you eat it. No. It's just going to ruin your dinner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't. Think, I haven't had that yeah. experience. Have you? Have you ever tried one? I've nibbled one. Yeah, they're nibbled. they're. Bleh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then with your agaricus, that's your field mushroom. So we're all kind of used to seeing those. Um, as long as it doesn't stay stain yellow and smell like army and navy stores. Um, again, subjective. Smell, the smell. smell like what? Sorry, army, army and navy, navy stores. stores. You know that kind of musty army navy surplus kind of shop that you get. Okay, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. That to me. <laughs> like old, old clothes, war, smelly yeah. old wardrobe clothes it's, smell. It's been up, been up in the loft for too long. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I think I think I'm remembering yeah. what that smell is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as long as it doesn't stain bright yellow and um, uh, have that smell then again again you're safe and if if you do eat a yellow stainer the worst you're going to get is friendly with your toilet yeah um and then your puff balls um your rule is as long as it's pure white and spongy and soft like marshmallow inside they're all edible um you know you look like is a an earth ball which i think smells like old-fashioned plasticine and is really yeah. hard and solid like a potato um and that but it can start off white in the middle. Um, and I think there is one that's kind of creamy colour in the middle um, and not yeah. black like the rest. Um, but again, you're going for that sort of squish. It's, it's using more than just your eyes to identify things. There's, it's there's this billions things. of those earth balls near me. It's, it's crazy. And the one thing they are good for, if, if, if not eating, is um, testing out your slow motion on your smartphone yes. camera and, and uh, flicking it. That's quite a good one to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, I do know somebody who, who, him and his girlfriend both ate them. Um, he was fine. She was very sick. Oh, um, nice. So again, it's. it's I'm, I wouldn't risk it. I've seen yeah. them when they're mature, and I'm just like, oh no. Yeah. I wouldn't. I didn't even know that they would be edible, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was just going to say for people who are listening and didn't know why I'd be flicking an earth ball, it's because the, yeah. the spores would be projectiling out of the little yeah. hole in the top. Um, um, which well, is, the, yeah, the, la the Latin for a puffball is lycopurdon, which means wolf fart. Wow. So if you've ever seen like a, a, a infrared um, video of somebody farting, that's what the spores come out like. 
I don't think I've ever seen an infrared video of anyone <laughs> farting, but you know, I can imagine. Wow, yeah. So almost like a uh, volcano like eruption. Boom. Yes, yeah, smoke, exactly. Smoke um, yeah, they're very cool to poke, and and you're helping them to germinate. You're helping those spores to to exactly get further. You, so you can get, any, get, on, favor. get a big tick in the sustainability. Yeah. Um, one of the few I, I don't do. mind kicking. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, uh, well, go on. No, I was yeah. going to say I'm. I'm trying. I'm hoping. Um, I found a, a mature giant puffball um, last year, and I've kicked it all around my garden. I'm hoping I'm going to get puffballs in my garden this year. That's the one thing that I mean. I've found a rotten, mag like mature, disgusting one, but I've never mm. seen one either small, medium or large size where it's, yeah. you know, in good condition. Um, and I, and someone pointed me on the, uh, the, the old um, Hugh Fernie Whittingstall episode where he, if someone, uh, some farmer like contacted them, he, they went down to the field, they got it yeah. giant beach ball size. And then he, he basically stuffed, stuffed it, the whole thing and right. roasted it. And um, I was like, Oh gosh, that's a, that's an event in and of itself. Yeah. That I, I just need to have in my life experience yeah. list. So yeah, if, if, and when I ever do find one, I'll be, uh, well, whole the, first one, and bacon. <laughs> the first one I ever found was a drive by forage. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't recommend efficient. Forage. Yeah. It's so dangerous. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, if you're the one driving. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard just to not look at the hedgerow. Um, yeah. And my, my husband was driving um, and I just shouted stop. And he was like, what the hell? And I jumped out of the car and I legged it back down the road and came back with this massive puffball. And he was just, God's sake. <laughs> Brilliant. It's, ama it's amazing how many times that happens when you become yeah. a, a forager, how many times you have to stop the car and uh, get out and run back. Yeah, so it happens a lot. I remember when um, it, was, it was during lockdown and uh, I'd just been from a COVID jab and um, there was a load of sweet wood rough outside the, the centre. And I was just like, can you just pull over? <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, that's another plant, actually, going back to the plant thing, that is amazing process, but on its own, as it is, is the... Um, so with the sweet wood rough, it's uh, related to sticky weed. Okay. It looks like sticky weed. It's not sticky. It's not as hairy. Um, but if you rub it, it kind of smells vanillary. Um, and that, if you dry it out, it's it's vanilla. It makes a lovely vanilla chai tea. Right. Um, what did you say it was called? Sweet wood rough. Sweet wo wood wood rough. rough. Wood rough. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah. Oh, very um, interesting. I have to look that one up. And you just reminded me as well, I can't let you go without, because another time when I was with you shadowing you, uh, you blew my mind when you told me about the um, uh, uh, horse, horse, horse chestnuts? No. Oh, the, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah, horse chestnut Con trees. Is that Conker right? Soap. Conker Soap, yeah. Yeah. Tell yeah, us about so... this. This is mad. Are you still so... doing it? Like, well, for... I'll let you talk. <laughs> what is it? It is. How did you blow so... my mind? Uh, horse chestnuts. Uh, so not the sweet chestnuts that we roast on a fire at Christmas, the horse ones that um, are in a, a leathery husk with a few spikes, whereas the sweet chestnuts are in the really... The ones you play spiky. conkers with as a kid in the yeah, school the ones you play playground. Yeah. So they're, they're nice and round with that little white um, patch on it. Um, they contain an awful lot of saponin, and saponin is the, the chemical that's in soap. Um, so you can collect your nuts in the autumn you then um chop them up chop them up when they're fresh because if you leave them to dry i then sp spend ages with a hammer <laughs> smashing them up um because they dry absolutely solid um and then you just pop them into a jam jar of hot water um and leave them to soak for about 10 minutes so i use uh, a little scoop about sort of this big, little, little pink vanish scoops, yeah. um, and you you put one of those in, so a handful of nuts in with your boiling water, and you leave it there for about ten minutes. You come back to it, and all the the saponins have come out, and you get this frothy yellowish liquid, um, and you strain that um, off the nuts, and you put that liquid then into your detergent drawer, 
and you press go and you wash your clothes and that's it um so you can you, if you're using the nuts like that you can use them three times so the second time you soak them for about an hour and then the third time you soak them overnight but i just get one of these great big massive kilner jars yeah. um and just put about four or five scoops in the bottom pour my boiling water over it and then just siphon off every time i do a wash and that jar sits in the fridge for a week and um, so you're still doing what what, what why do you i do am this? but why it was you... well What's the... one for my little boy because detergent really upsets his eczema okay um and it gets them in the back of the legs and they, they weep and they bleed and since doing this um i've found it, it doesn't have it anymore it's because it has none um, of the it's got none of the nasty manufactured in it, nasty chemicals in it um it's another thing to geek out on and forage yeah um it's free yeah the um forage is magic um, lad. Uh, yeah exactly um and I have found that since ditching fake smells, so um, like the perfume laundry detergent, which has all that like kind of flowery smell, for, mm. <laughs> um, and 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 like all my cleaning products have gone for scentless. Um, my sense of smell is incredible. I can tell you when it's about to rain um, because I can smell it coming because I'm not surrounded by all this chemical smell that's just dulling my my sense of smell mm. um so um also very good for being a mushroom forager because i mean my smell's not that great but i yeah. go out with my partner danny and she's like yeah. hold on ben um there's mushrooms here <laughs> and then yep. we start looking around yep. and lo and behold <laughs> um i did that at um over christmas um so i went out with um Jesper and, and another friend, Kerry, who's at the foraging course company. <laughs> um, yes. uh, we'd gone to Delamere Forest and um, we'd uh, obviously Jesper's big into his truffles. And I, I'd, I've never found one. I'd love to. Um, and uh, we were under, I think we we're under Scott's Pine. And I was like, oh, there could be deer truffles here. So, um, yeah, there was, there was, three randomers in the middle of the woods with people walking past and we were on all, all, all fours with the bums in the air sniffing holes in the crowd <laughs> nice um, that was when i discovered i'd found my people <laughs> yeah Do you know, after i after i spoke to jesper and because he he does most of his truffle foraging finding seeking without yeah. the use of his dog and so he's he like is, he is part truffle hound i'm sure yeah it's crazy <laughs> but it, it filled me with such confidence that i could just you know go out and just yeah. find some truffles without yeah. buddy or without a dog and uh so if anyone is interested in looking and seeking truffles and just wants a bit of like you know encouragement definitely go yeah. back and listen to that uh, episode because yeah. uh jesper will fill you with fill you with possibility which is yeah. great yeah. and uh, well, I, I do keep and you've experienced it firsthand yeah <laughs> every well it's you know you, every time i see like a an old mature tree or or something like an oak tree on there's like obvious fresh dig sites i'm like i'll, I'll catch up whoever i'm with yeah. <laughs> and there's me on my hands and knees desperate to find one but like you say it's that kind of underground thing so not many people spot them and they're harder because they are, are under there but you, you've got to use your nose um definitely yeah. um i'm very conscious of your time and i think this has been great so far i just have like you know a couple of final sort of questions and stuff before, right. before we wrap up um and but before i ask you is, is there any other things or stories or tad bits of tidbits of wisdom that you want to share that you sort of um has, hasn't come out yet but no worries if it hasn't that's all good um um, well, I mean, I know you said about the poison stuff. Yeah. I've not really talked talked much about poison. Poison's cool. Mm, God, <laughs> my husband's this terrified. Is your, I'm this is your thing. Let's. What yeah, What yeah, fascinates yeah. you about poisonous mushrooms? Uh, well, it's not just mushrooms either. It's plants. Okay. Um, so I think I actually think plants are scarier than mushrooms. Um, you know, we've we've said before that you know there's no mushroom in the UK that it's going to do in harm unless you physically ingest it. Mm -hmm. um, and start like digesting those those toxins but plants like nettles i mean they're, they're technically toxic because you touch them and it hurts mm. um i mean nettles i do uh, 
Oh, that's an entire podcast, that is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nettles are amazing. But um, things like um, giant hogweed. I am obsessed with giant hogweed. I love the stuff. It's it's beautiful. Um, and it I just fascinates me. So the, the furicumarin in giant hogweed um, binds with the nucleus of your skin cell, destroying the cell and changing your DNA to prevent you then from um, producing melanin, which protects you from the sun. So then you end up with phytophotodermatitis and you get third degree sunburn every time you go out in the sun. Mm. Um, which is bonkers, just from, from getting a tiny bit of juice off this plant. Um, Have and... you done a personal <laughs> experiment on this? Yeah. The first foraging course I went on, the instructor had just, like a few days before yeah. or whatever, burnt himself basically with this. So, yeah. with yeah, giant you, hogweed. did you do that as well? So I I was looking at common hogweed. So okay. earlier in January, maybe it was two, common hogweed. Then I was, yeah, uh, it was yeah. twenty twenty two spring spring of twenty two. I had a bit of a reckless spring. Decided to to lick a leaf of hemlock and see if that did anything. And yes, I had some burning at the back of my throat. Don't recommend that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I'd read an article about common hogweed. And whenever people come on courses or I talk to people who have had common hogweed burns, they've mm. always been strimming. So it's the strimmers that get splashed with the juice and whatnot. And I read this article where some scientists tested the level of pure kumarin in the common hogweed. Uh, you know, they tested one plant and it, it, it was minor. You know, it wasn't very much, uh, not enough to, to do any phototoxic harm. Um, and then they cleared some of the neighbor, neighboring plants and the, um, the quantity of this chemical increased. And they kept clearing and picking neighboring plants and it increased and it increased the more they picked. Great example of the wood wide web where plants talk mm. to through, through networks underground. Yeah. And saying, Guys, something's picking us or eating us. Send out that chemical that protects us. Um, so I was with a, with a friend. I'm just going to throw out another fray of forages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, she, she makes this most amazing uh, weed pie which is like hogweed and cow parsley and cheese and pastry. It's amazing. So I was helping her pick um, pick some hogweed stems um, because in the spring when they're, they're little shoots, they are incredible. So I picked one and I was like, you know what, I'm going to rub a bit of sap on my arm and see what happens. Um, and then I picked quite a few more and I rubbed another bit further down my arm. And then like when we'd, picked our last one i rubbed that on on the lower bit of my arm and uh just you know wandered around with it held out to the sun to see what happened and and nothing happened and then two days later i'd gone to to my local uh rubbish tip uh, and we've been doing um some renovations right bits of concrete and i was like oh have i got concrete burns on my arm or something completely forgotten that I'd rubbed this hogweed on me um, so the top bit where I'd rubbed the first bit of juice I had no reaction the second bit I got this sort of lumpy bumpy weird rash and then the lower bit where I put the third amount um, the, the final picking I got a very nice blister wow <laughs> So, so yeah, I mean it was full. So full what's actually going on there? Test. I know you said the World Wide um, Web explains so, to so people what. So basically, the the um uh the the chemical has done damage to my skin cells, and it had stopped me from producing melanin, which is the compound within your body that is it a compound, the stuff in your body that um stops you from getting sunburn. Yeah. So actually, me going to the tip with just a t-shirt on and my arms out, I ended up with third degree sunburn, mm. um, which uh, it it it's it's kind of a mixture of sunburn and then like a, a chemical burn as well at the same time because of the reaction going on with you, within your skin, and I have never experienced some any, anything like it in terms of being itchy as hell. 
mm. I would have quite happily got on a knife and just scraped my own skin off. Oof. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then and then obviously I had the blister as well. Um, I can send you pictures if you want. <laughs> um, and I think I coped for about two weeks of of it being like this, and it wasn't getting better. I was putting things like plantain on it, which is like an antihistamine, and uh, just keeping it moisturized. But it was it was I mean it was so itchy it was waking me up in the night because I needed to scratch it. And in the end, I ran, rang the doctors and I said, oh, I've got um, a common hogweed burn. And they were like, oh, oh, how, how do you know it's a common hogweed? And I was like, oh, I've rubbed common hogweed on my skin <laughs> as a bit of an experiment. And, and the doctor just called me an idiot. <laughs> um, but it just, it just fascinated me how a tiny bit of sap from a plant that's feeling not stressed compared to a plant that's like, whoa, my God, I need to protect myself, mm. has done such a difference in damage. So um, what, what's actually going on there, like with the, the three different burns? Just explain to people um, like, so, what's so, actually happening. Yeah, so obviously the first one is low concentration of the furic murin, so that's that chemical. The second one was like a, a not enough to cause me to blister. Um so it's not it's not doing enough damage to get the sunlight down to the the third degree burn level of skin. Um, so I probably got like first or second degree burn on the second one, but then the third one there was enough um, genetic degeneration of my my mm. melanin to to get the sun in right down to the lower parts of my skin um, to then cause a third degree burn blister. <laughs> Blimey. I know I'm an idiot. <laughs> and so uh, what's what's happening there story. is the plant is actually responding to you irritating it or killing yeah. parts of it, and then yeah. it is communicating to the other part of the plant yeah. to okay. to increase well, the production of this plants. a so separate this is plant. Se separate plants. So um, what's going on there? So again, this is like the wood wide web where they're talking to each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a study um, done in it's somewhere in Africa with giraffes, um, and the the certain trees, uh, when one tree is being attacked or well, eaten by giraffes, the neighbouring trees get a message from that tree to say, "Hey, the giraffes are here. Make the leaves really bitter, mm. so that they don't eat them." Um, Fascinating. You know, so I mean, it, it's just so cool. Nature is geeky yeah, yeah. cool, um, and you know, the, everything out there is talking to each other apart from us. You know, all the other animals are are listening and responding and smelling and tasting and going, "Oh, that's not right. I'll go somewhere else." Whereas we just we make it so it's easy for ourselves with all the farming and everything, and we've we've lost that communication with nature mm. um and then again that's where your foraging comes in because you you go back and you you have a chat with the plants you hug the trees and <laughs> um you know and and with foraging and the more you do it the longer you do it um you sort of go oh okay it was a crap year for you um or or you know like Last year was an amazing year for porcini. I have never found more porcini than I did last year. Um, and then this year, it could be a crap year again. Mm. Um, and it's it's okay. Well, you've you've responded to probably a really hot summer and then a quick wet autumn and then just gone poof, send up all these mushrooms, yeah. you know. And 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 so they're all sort of talking to each other and all responding and and that then affects how much they produce or what they produce and mm. how it tastes and stuff. So it's, I would like to have an ear back in the soil just to hear what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody brilliant. could invent that. That would be great. Thanks. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, Sam, I think that's a perfect place to, um, you know, to, to wrap things up. And I just wanted to, you know, really appreciate, really appreciate you coming on. It's been fantastic. Oh, and, I have honest really enjoyed having somebody sharing just stories <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i uh, love yeah. to have you back on again some point in the future yeah yeah um, definitely and uh, just to leave people with is, is there any 
anywhere the listeners or the watchers can go and check out more about what you're up to, follow you on your socials? What what would you like? Yeah, to so um I'm foraging for ages or foraging forages. Um okay, depending yeah. on how you want to play it. Nice little con on words there. Um so foraging for ages on Facebook and the website is foragingforages.com. Um I am forager Sam on Insta. Yeah. In the process of trying to work out how to change that to foraging for ages, but it seems pointless setting up a new one and then trying to get more followers. But if you want to follow me, that'd be great. Um, and yeah. And whereabouts are you based in the UK? Just for people so who I'm, may be wanting to come and on a, on a course with you or something. Yeah, so I'm based in Cheshire. Uh, Cheshire. But I'm, you know, happy to travel about, about two hours either way, anyway. Um, you know, so come and find me. Um, up in Lytham in March, doing a few things in Stoke, um, Shropshire, we've got Hawkstone Folly, very nice place to go. Um, so yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you again, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Cool, all right. Take care. Bye. Bye.